Hi, my name is Chris O'Connell and today is November 13th, 2003 and me and my partner Carl Watts are interviewing Francis Chesnick, a World War II veteran. What's your full name? <coughs> Francis Chesnick. Where and when were you born? <coughs> I was born uh, on a farm uh, about a mile from a little village called Uniondale in northeastern Pennsylvania. February 14, 1925. Uh, what education did you have prior to going into the service? <clears throat> I had uh, eight years of elementary uh, school and uh, four years of high school. <clears throat> I graduated from high school in 1942. Did you have a job before you enlisted into the military? <clears throat> yes, uh, you see, I was 17 when I graduated from high school, and I had a year to go before I w would have to register for the military, so I worked in a local creamery where farmers brought their milk uh, uh, for collection. Did you enlist in, why did you enlist in the military? <clears throat> I didn't enlist, I uh, uh, had to sign up for the draft when I was 18 years old. I was 18 years old on February 14th, 1943. And, uh, that's when I registered for the military. What branch of service uh, were you in? I was in the Army. Uh, is this what you wanted to be in, or did you want to be in like the Air Force or something well, like I, that? Well, when I was 17, I wanted to enlist in the Air Force, but uh, my mother wouldn't uh, let me do it. Uh, uh, she thought, uh, I don't know what she thought, but anyway, uh, I had to wait a year before I uh, could get into the military when I was drafted. Uh, where did you go for basic training? For basic training, I uh, went to uh, Fort Hood, Texas, and took basic training in the tank destroyers. Uh, what did you learn while you were there? Uh, <clears throat> regular basic training, which really hasn't changed uh, uh, to date <laughs> from way back then. Uh, we took uh, Calisthenics, uh, short order drill. Uh, we, we learned a little jujitsu. Uh, jiu went on long marches. Learned all the uh, nomenclature of uh, the various uh, uh, arms that the military used. Uh, it was, took about uh, 13, uh, 13 weeks of uh, basic training. Did you learn to use any specific weapons? Yes, the, uh, actually the M1 rifle. Since this was your first experience in the military, what did you feel about it? Did you like it? Or? Well, uh, when uh, I was home on the farm, uh, <clears throat> we uh, didn't have any place to go really. Uh, we were, uh, Binghamton, New York was 45 miles away and uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania was 25 miles away. And prior going to the military, I, I hardly, uh, those were the farthest places I got away from home. And uh, which wasn't very often, really. So uh, uh, I was really <clears throat> happy to go uh, uh, to join the military. In your information, it says you were selected for your Army specialized training. What was that? <clears throat> to this day, I wondered why they did it. But anyway, uh, uh, the Army uh, set up a program where uh, people with uh, higher IQs would uh, go to college, and. Uh, they took about 250,000 of us, uh, 18 and 19 year old, and uh, I went to Louisiana State University for a while and then trans transferred to a little college in western uh, Louisiana called McNeese College at uh, Lake Charles. And uh, I studied engineering there for uh, uh, eight months and then they disbanded the program. After you went to this training, what units or ships were you assigned to? I was assigned uh, uh, after the Army Specialized Training Program, that was the STP. I was assigned to the 99th Infantry Division, which was stationed at that time at Camp Maxey in northeastern uh, Texas. When did you leave the U.S. to go to Europe and fight? <clears throat> we we uh, left Camp Maxey uh, the first part of uh, September in uh, 1944, and uh, the whole division assembled at, at Boston, 
and uh, we sailed out from Boston uh, on the 29th of September 1944 for, for uh, Scotland. We uh, left in a convoy of 150 ships, all types of uh, ships, troop, troop ships, uh, oil tankers, uh, uh, whatnot. Since this was when you were going over there, what did you expect to, what did you think was going to happen? Well, <laughs> I guess you don't really realize uh, what's going to happen until you actually get, get into it. Uh, we just wondered uh, when we would actually get into the uh, fighting, into the, in, in, into the front, front, front lines and so forth. But uh, you really don't feel the reality of it until, uh, until you get there. Uh, do you have any special jobs that you had to do? Well, <clears throat> when I uh, first was there in, in, my, in, my, in my squad, I, uh, they gave me an 03 uh, uh, Springfield rifle with a scope on it, and so uh, I was the sniper of the, of, of the crew. <clears throat> but on our first action, my, that scope we had on there, why, it, it fogged up all the time, so when we got back to our base, why, uh, I asked for an M1 rifle. What was this like being a sniper? Like, what what did you have to do? Well, what I had to, had to do, if uh, like if we went on patrol or, or something, why like, mm -hmm. uh, if we caught a sight of the enemy uh, in in the distance or so, I I had to try to pick him off. How were your officers? Did you like them? And yes, my them? officers were good. I, uh, I I I liked them. When would when did you first experience uh, your first combat? Well, we, we uh, <clears throat> our whole division went on the front line on November 9th, 1944, in uh, eastern Belgium. And uh, two days later, my squad, uh, there were 12 of us, we went on a patrol uh, toward the German lines, and uh, after about a mile in front of our positions, we, we spied some movement in the woods. It was heavily forested there, like... Uh, uh, the trees were these big spruce, just like they grow around here, mm -hmm. here and there, but there was a whole forest of them. But we, uh, we spied some movement in there, and uh, of course uh, we were trying to get cover quick, and we got all down behind those big, big spruce trees, and sure enough, a German patrol of about 50 people were, were coming towards us. And uh, we were in a position to ambush them, which, which we did. This was, uh, this was two days after we got online. And uh, <clears throat> we killed a few of them, and uh, they took off the other way. And of course, this was our first action, and uh, we took off the other way, back to, <laughs> back to our lines. But that was the first action, uh, really, uh, real action of the 99th Infantry Division in, in World War II. So was this like, were you expecting it? To be, was it different than what you expected, or? Not, not really. Uh, you know, we, we were trained, you know, to do what we had to do. Uh, and in your information, it says you fought many battles. Tell us about your experience in uh, the Battle of the Rue River Dams. Yeah, on, uh, it was a, about uh, March, maybe 5th or the 6th, we got to the Rhine River uh, right across from the city of Dusseldorf. We thought we were going to have a, <coughs> a little, uh, a good rest there because uh, the Rhine was about 400 miles from Switzerland to the North Sea, and uh, the Germans were blowing every bridge. And uh, lo and behold, on the I guess it, yeah, it was the 7th of March, <coughs> our 9th Armored Division captured a bridge at Remagen. So uh, right, right the next day, why we were put on the alert that uh, we were going to go down and cross the bridge and. Uh, uh, expand the bridgehead on the other side and it was on the I believe it was on the 10th of March my division crossed the bridge I walked across the <coughs> Ramagan bridge and uh, we uh, fought to expand the bridgehead on the on the other on the other side Could you tell us about the Battle of the Bulge our our division as I mentioned before we went online uh, on a 20-mile front from the village of uh, uh, the Kalmanshow, Germany, down to a, a village called Lotion. It was about 20 miles. And uh, 
it was heavily forested, a uh, whole spruce forest of uh, oh, about anywhere from uh, four to seven, eight miles in, in depth. And this was, we were practically on the German-Belgium uh, uh, border. And uh, <clears throat> if it came back west, uh, it was all farmlands, little, little villages of anywhere 500 to 1,000 uh, people. And there's only three or four roads coming through from uh, Germany uh, back through our lines. Uh, and uh, uh, of course we had those heavily, uh, heavily defended. And uh, on the 16th of uh, December, wholly unexpected, at 5.30 in the morning, the uh, <coughs> Germans uh, let off with a heavy artillery bar barrage, which lasted about an hour and a half. And then they, they attacked with, uh, with, 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 the, with their infantry. And the, on, the, on the west side of uh, that forest was a little village called Elsenborn. And uh, <coughs> the object of the Germans in the first day uh, they were supposed to uh, clear the forest, uh, uh, kill or capture the enemy, uh, capture Elsenborn by uh, 11 o'clock, and then uh, form a defensive line uh, to prevent uh, reinforcements, American reinforcements, from coming down from the north. Well, uh, we fought for, for four days in that, in that woods, and uh, <clears throat> the Germans never did capture Elsenborn. They never did capture it. Uh, the whole, during the whole Battle of the Bulge. And uh, our division from the north part, we, we swung like, a, like opening a door. Right in, up in the north part, uh, the village of Mancio, we didn't, the Germans didn't get through it all there. But when you got to the end of it, through the 20 mile, they got about five or six, uh, five or, five or six miles. But in those four days, uh, our division lost uh, about uh, somewhere in the area of uh, 3,000 uh, men, uh, casualties, uh, wounded, and, 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 uh, and, and killed. It was heavily forested. We, uh, <clears throat> we, well, for example, uh, we left England about uh, the late in October, and uh, I wasn't able to take my clothes off to take a shower until Late in February, <laughs> three and a half months, uh, three and a half months later, and uh, <clears throat> during those four or five days where it was uh, where we fought heavily there to prevent the Germans from breaking through, I, uh, we we had nothing to eat except uh, chocolate bars, uh, things, things things like this. Uh, we slept maybe curled around uh, one of those spruce trees. Uh, uh, it was just uh, just terrible uh, ter terrible conditions. Uh, living, but uh, actually we did our job to prevent the Germans from uh, making a big break, breakthrough up uh, in the northern part there. Oh. The snow was, snow is uh, terrible too, it was one of the worst uh, years for snow that uh, Belgium ever had. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the uh, Battle of the Rhineland? Uh, the Battle of the uh, Rhineland uh, it was entirely different from the country we were in. It was farm country. It was all, it was all level. And uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the Germans really lost their will to fight. So uh, we made it uh, across the Rhineland, uh, you know, from the village of uh, in the area of Aachen, Germany, to uh, uh, to Dusseldorf. Uh, we made it in just about six days. Uh, I think it was about. 50, 60 miles there. But uh, the Germans then put up a, a lot of resistance, except in a, in a, in a couple of the towns there. Um, what happened in the Battle of the Remagen Bridge? Well, the Remagen Bridge, uh, of course, uh, the bridge was still standing there when we crossed it. We crossed it, uh, the, so I think it was about uh, March the 10th or so. And uh, inland, from the Rhine inland, from uh, uh, towards uh, toward Germany, it was about oh uh, well, maybe about 20 miles, and that was rugged country. And the uh, <clears throat> reason why we wanted to get those 20 miles was uh, uh, there was a super highway, just like our our two ways, four lane highways, mm -hmm. running down uh, uh, in the interior of Germany, down uh, you might say from uh, Cologne down into. Uh, down to Frankfurt, and we wanted those 
that four lane highway so we could put our armor on there and just just take off but it was awful uh, awful rugged country uh, we, we slugged it out with the with, with the Germans uh, we, we crossed rivers uh, at night where the water was you know the, the snow was melting mm -hmm. I remember one night we crossed the river was the water was right up to my uh, right up to my shoulders and uh, It was uh, it was it was really really tough going uh, going in there, but uh, it took us probably two weeks to uh, uh, get our uh, objective over there. Uh, what'd you do um, in the rural industrial area? Well, <clears throat> the first thing they told us when we uh, we we had it uh, completely encircled with uh, several divisions, and uh, I remember they told us uh, there's fifty thousand German soldiers in there. Well. We ended up capturing uh, 350,000, <laughs> and <clears throat> that was that was rugged, rugged country. Also, it was uh, we we met the re resistance here and there, but uh, as I mentioned before, the, the Germans had lost their their will to fight, and uh, most of the time they were ready to capture. Sometimes I captured 50, 100 in, in, in one in uh, in one bunch, just, just myself. You know, they'd, they'd uh, put up their hands throw their rifles away or whatever. And, and even on one occasion, what was less left of one of their armored divisions, just because we couldn't uh, uh, control it that much, we told them to come right through. They come right through with their big tanks all loaded. To, <laughs> and <laughs> it, was, it was scary because, uh, <clears throat> you know, one of those guys could throw a hand grenade or pick you off with yeah. a rifle mm -hmm. or so. Uh, they were, they were uh, like we were, you know. Uh, they didn't want to get killed and didn't want to get hurt. Most of them, so uh, we got through it all right. It says you were in the Army of Occupation in Germany. Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. What What did you do there? We were assigned to a town, and uh, all we did was uh, uh, stand along the bridge or intersection. Uh, there were all kinds of people. Uh, displaced people coming through, civilians. They wanted to get back to their country or, or their home. They come in lines all the, all the while. Thousands of them come on, come, coming through. But all we did, uh, all we did was uh, check some of them out. Uh, if anybody looks suspicious or anything like. That. It was an easy life. Uh, the, uh, the occupation. Um, it says you were a sergeant at a prisoner of war camp. Is that is that right? Yeah. After uh, after uh, occupation, <clears throat> you had to have it, had to have a certain number of points that they call them, a certain number of criteria that uh, was assigned to those points. And of course, I was uh, I was single, had no uh, uh, dependents back home, and uh, well, we didn't get over there until. Uh, late, late in 1944, so I had to wait until my points accumulated before I could come home. So I was <coughs> assigned to a prisoner of war camp uh, just outside Brussels, Belgium. And uh, all we did was watch over the prisoners, uh, uh, gave them work details. Um, did you win any awards for your service in these battles or anything? Well. Uh, of course, right after we uh, ambushed that German patrol on uh, November 11th, so I, uh, our uh, regimental com commander, uh, the 12 of us, he came up and uh, gave us the combat in infantry badge. The combat infantry badge uh, eventually was given to everybody who was uh, in the infantry in, in combat. I have a picture of that uh, reg uh, regimental commander awarding the. Uh, Combat infantry, uh, 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 combat infantry badge to us, uh, and uh, we got the we got the bronze star, which uh, is uh, is the lowest star, lowest combat combat medal. Oh, uh, how did it feel to get these medals? The combat infantry badge was uh, the one you wanted because mm -hmm. uh, not too many of the total army was uh, in, in, the, in the infantry, right, right in the front lines. And uh, in the front lines, uh, the infantryman, the rifleman, he, uh, 
there were, I think, 20% of, of the total was, in the, was the infantry, and they suffered 90% of the casualties. I wasn't too, too enthused about uh, getting, uh, getting medals. There, there are a lot of people who should have them, then never got them, and people who got them who, who shouldn't uh, uh, have gotten them. I, uh, I think they, sometimes they, they got them. Um, since you were in Europe, when did you find out about the uh, concentration camps that the Nazis had? I can't remember whether we uh, we knew whether I found out about them. But I, I think I found out about them uh, from reading newspapers e even before I was in the army. Part of, part of my division uh, uh, went through one of those uh, areas where the concentration camps are, but my regiment uh, wasn't so. Long. I didn't see him at all while I was in Germany. Uh, when you when during the war, what what were you guys fed? Was the food good or the food that you were fed was it good or anything like that? The food, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, our staple in the infantry were, were K rations, and uh, they come in a a, a, a plastic in a wax coated cardboard box, and in there uh, there was a breakfast, dinner, and uh, supper. Supper. Uh, the breakfast had uh, uh, powdered eggs in there, mixed together, and tasted like. <laughs> and the, the dinner, uh, I think it had uh, it was a little can of cheese, and the supper was hash. And in addition to that, uh, there was a chocolate bar, uh, mm -hmm. Hershey chocolate bar, uh, very concentrated. It was sort of a solid bar. And sometimes that was our only food for a day, like during the Battle of the Bulge and some other time. And there was a little package of crackers and uh, a cup of uh, a plastic uh, bag of uh, uh, Nestle's uh, coffee, instant coffee. And uh, that coffee, uh, a lot of times, uh, that was about the only warm thing we had to drink when we uh, emptied the carton uh, when they came in, why uh, it was wax, wax cardboard coated, and uh, we, we lit that with a match and uh, uh, packed our canteen cup full of snow. And uh, by the time that uh, carton was melted, you had uh, warm warm water, maybe a couple inches in the in the canteen, and we dumped that uh, coffee in there, and we had a warm warm cup of warm cup of coffee. In, also in that little package was uh, some matches and uh, a little box of, I think there were either three or five cigarettes in there. I didn't smoke. I, I didn't smoke before I went to the army. To this day I never smoked. So uh, I gave those cigarettes uh, to people who smoked. And most, most people smoked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it easy to keep in touch with people back home? Yeah, we had uh, what we called, uh, I forget, uh, uh, little uh, uh, papers where you wrote a letter on, uh, and I, I guess they microfilled them or did, did something with them, but I, I carried them down in my, in my shirt and I had a pencil someplace in my pocket. So we, we, any, any time you wanted to write, you could write. And uh, we had uh, mail coming from home, mail going out uh, practically every day. They had a system set up. What was your uh, funniest and most memorable moments of the war? The funniest? <laughs> well, I guess uh, it'll, be, it'll be a little story, my funny. When we cro uh, crossed the Ramagan Bridge, uh, there was a sign up there. It said, uh, Cross the Rhine with dry feet, courtesy of the 9th Armored Division. The 9th Armored Division captured, captured the bridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that stuck in my memory after the war, and I, I often wondered what happened to that sign. And uh, about three years ago, I was down in Fort Knox, Kentucky. That's the uh, <coughs> armored, uh, uh, you might say, the, our, our main armored training camp. And they have a museum there with all the uh, 
especially the tanks of uh, ours and the Germans there, see. Mm -hmm. And while I was going through the museum, I looked up and I saw the sign that said, uh, one arrow pointed to Dusseldorf and the other arrow pointed to Cologne. So when I got past on the other side, where I looked up on the other side, uh, that sign said, uh, this is in the museum down in Fort Knox, it said, cross the Rhine with dry feet, courtesy of the Ninth Armour Division. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, <laughs> I thought that was uh, rather humorous, you know, there, there, mm -hmm. there's humor in, the, in, in war. Uh, what was the other part? Your most memorable moment. Most memorable moment. I guess when the war was over, you know, when the war was over, we were down in southern Germany. Uh, there was no throwing up the guns or whooping and hauling. I guess maybe I just turned to the guy who was next to me and shook his hand and said, glad we made it, something like that. Or, Thank God we made it. Who were some of the people you remember the most from the war? I guess uh, what I would say is uh, the fellows that were closest to me during the war in, in, my, in my squad and uh, uh, certainly those that were, uh, that, that, that were, that were killed. You, you became just like family to, uh, to the 10 or 12 people who were with you and uh, casualties uh, kept that squad down to about 7 or 8 people most of the time. When did you return home from the war? I got home, uh, I was discharged uh, down at Fort Meade, Maryland on uh, March 6th, 1946. I have my, I have my discharge with me. <laughs> what was it like when you came back home? Were there a lot of parades or anything like that? No. Not, uh, I, I guess right after the war, uh, see, the, the war was over on May 8th, 1945, and uh, it wasn't long after that, a lot, of, a lot of the soldiers started coming home, and of course, like cities like New York, and the big cities, like, you know, they, they, had, they had big parades and, and, and so forth. But by the time I got home a year later, I, uh, all it was was, uh, well, we came into uh, New York Harbor. On the on the probably around the third or fourth of uh, March, nineteen forty forty six, and uh, when we got into the harbor, it was uh, late at night, and uh, of course we could see all the lights uh, on the island and so forth. What they look good, <laughs> and uh, we stayed on the ship right in the harbor overnight. Uh, I guess they went unload us overnight. But the next morning, uh, talk about a memorable moment too. Uh, uh, the next morning, when I looked out and I got light, I saw the U.S. flag flying over one of the buildings in New York City. And boy, said, I said, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you say you have your certificate of honorable discharge there. What was that ceremony like? Oh, this here? Yeah. They just, it, there was a girl, we went in the, uh, in a, uh, where I was discharged down in Fort Meade, Maryland, where I discharged the... Uh, and of course, there were a lot of people getting discharged at the same time, and there were a lot of clerks. Mine was a girl. She just had a little booth and uh, filled this out. We went over it together, and uh, uh, she gave it to me, and that was it. Well, what were your feelings about this? Like, do you, were you happy now that you were out? Or? Well, uh, I guess I had mixed feelings, really. Uh, I didn't really know what, what I was going, uh, going to do, and uh, uh, but, uh, I, was, I guess I was happy, and at the same time I, I, I felt a little, uh, little down, too. Um, when, Ed, when you got home, what did you do? Did you go to school, or did you get a job? Or? When I got, uh, got home, uh, I went back to work in that little creamery that where the farmers brought their brought their milk and uh, when we were growing kids growing up on the farm, we, uh, about the only entertainment uh, we could do was what we could uh, make up for ourselves. So there's always uh, about ten of us around. I come from a family of uh, seven boys and six girls, and the five of us eventually were in the military in World War Two. 
but uh, we played baseball a lot. <laughs> played it every day. We played it in school. And uh, so I, I had a chance to uh, play uh, uh, professional baseball for uh, a couple of years, uh, which, which I did. I got hooked on with a, with a team, uh, uh, with a team like we used to have here in, in Utica. Uh, this was back in 1947-48. And uh, I played two years of that. I, I hurt my arm and uh, those le little leagues, they start uh, falling apart then. And I came back, come back, I, I worked in that uh, creamery for a while, but uh, while I was playing ball, the guys asked me, what are you going to do? He said, why don't you go to college? So, uh, I guess it was the fall of 1948, uh, I uh, went to uh, Penn State, I graduate, graduated from uh, Penn State in 1952 with a degree in agriculture economics. And, uh, I worked with a farm cooperative for better than, better than 40 years. I retired from, uh, from, from that cooperative. It was called uh, Dairy Lee. It's still in business today. After your experiences in the military, would you recommend it to others? If you like uh, uh, regimentation, uh, uh, I like the Army. In fact, I had signed up for the reserve for, for three years and uh, while I was in Penn State my papers came to uh, sign up again and uh, my mother threw them in the fire. <laughs> but anyway I guess that was a, a, a pretty good idea because all those who were even in college at the time they were called to go to the Korean War and if I had stayed in the reserves I would have, have been in the, in the Korean War also. Hmm. Yeah, I would, uh, I would recommend uh, anybody, especially coming out of high school, uh, to sign up two or three years or so because you're young yet. See if you uh, like, like, like the Army. Uh, there's all kinds of benefits today in the, uh, in, in the Army. And uh, if you don't uh, like it, you've got plenty of time to uh, do what you want to yet. When I, uh, went to Penn State, I was, uh, as a freshman, I was uh, 23 years old. How has the, um, being in the military influenced your life? One thing that it did, it, uh, well, uh, going through combat and all that, uh, it, it, it certainly uh, made you, what you call, you might say, grow up quick. Uh, as far as responsibility goes, I guess that just adds to it because uh, growing up on a farm, uh, doing all the farm chores and so forth, you learn uh, responsibility of work uh, real, real uh, at, a, at, a, at a young age. But I think it, it, it disciplines you. Uh, it gives you certainly a different outlook on life. It helps you to uh, uh, build your career, what you want to do. Uh, uh, in, in your future, uh, uh, things like this. I think it has a, a big impact on, on, on your life. That's all I have to Want to add anything else there? Okay, I'll, what I'll do... Uh, just a lot of life prior to, the, prior to the Army. We covered the Army life pretty good. Uh, and then you can do what you want with it. I, I thought here if I if I had started off what I would do it do it like this. My name is Francis Chesnick. I reside in the town of Deerfield, which is just north of the city of Utica in Oneida County, New mm -hmm. York. But I'm a native of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was born on a, a dairy farm in northeastern Pennsylvania, about halfway between uh, uh, Binghamton, New York, and Scranton, Pennsylvania near a little village called, uh, called Uniondale. Prior to the Army, uh, those two cities, Scranton and Binghamton, uh, were as, as far as I, I got, and very occasionally uh, did we get there. So our life was uh, centered around the farm and our two-room uh, country school. Uh, our family comprised seven boys and uh, six girls uh, in addition to our uh, mother, mother and father. Five of us eventually got into the military. 
I was born on February 25th, 1925. Ours was a dairy farm. We were not mechanized, uh, very few farms were mechanized in the 1930s, so all the work on the farm was done by, was done by uh, horse-drawn machinery. We learned to uh, do work on the farm at a very young age. For example, I learned to milk cows by hand and uh, milked a certain number of cows morning and night even before I, uh, or before I went, to, went, went to school. I don't think we looked upon those chores as a burden, but uh, as a satisfaction of getting a job done and uh, running the farm and uh, uh, making a living at it. For my first eight years of school, I went to a school, a two-room school. That was one and a half miles from our home. We walked to school, there's no buses uh, to take us in, but we walked to school and uh, back in the uh, early 30s, uh, very few people, especially on the farms, had telephones or radi radios, so we went to school every day. Uh, whether we had a blizzard, whether we were snowed in, or whether there was a thunderstorm or not, because there's no way you could contact everybody, so we just went to school, that was it. And everybody was in the, in the same boat. <clears throat> that two-room school had two teachers, uh, they taught, uh, each of them taught four, four grades. And uh, while, I, while I was uh, in the fifth grade, uh, my teacher asked me when I come back in the fall if I wanted to take sixth and seventh grade together in one year. I said, why not? So uh, <laughs> that's what I did. And uh, that's why I uh, graduated high school when I was 17 instead of, uh, instead of, instead of uh, 18. For going to high school, uh, that two-room school only had eight grades, so going to high school, we went uh, five miles away from our, uh, uh, from our village. And uh, <clears throat> I graduated uh, there in uh, 1942. And uh, I graduated, uh, I guess, some would have to say, uh, in, in, in tops of my class as far as uh, average goes. I, I was in tops of, of 100 in a hundred in my graduating class, so I, 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 was, I, was, I was stopped there. Most of that graduating class uh, went off to the military, uh, various, various parts of the military class of 42, but I, I had to wait, a, wait another year, so that's when I took the job with, uh, uh, in the creamery where the fa farmers brought their milk. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1944. The war in Europe was going on since Germany attacked Poland on September 1st, 1939. During those two years, our country was pretty well divided on whether we should enter the war or not. There was a lot of debates going on, just like here when you have a controversy, you know, like today. But then when the Japs attack, attacked Pearl Harbor, why, it changed completely. The whole country got behind the war effort and uh, uh, figured that was the thing to do, is to uh, <coughs> Get, out, get into war and uh, defeat uh, Germany and Japan. One of the things Japan had in mind, uh, uh, they had a whole list of things uh, listed out there. They were going to uh, conquer uh, China, which they did, take control of the Pacific practically, which they did, and then destroy the United States. Think about that. Mm -hmm. They went there and destroyed the United States. I remember clearly what I was doing when uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. I was uh, 16, uh, 16 years old, and uh, on our farm we heated our house uh, with coal and wood. And we always had a, a supply of wood in our woodshed. And that Sunday afternoon I had an armful of wood brought into the house, and uh, my mother was listening to the radio when I got in. She said the Japs attacked Pearl Harbor. I knew where Pearl Harbor was in the Hawaiian Islands uh, because in school, in grade school even, we, we took a course called Geography. And uh, in Geography you learned uh, uh, the continents and their relation to each other, the oceans relations, the relation to each other, and the rivers and so forth. So we had a pretty good idea. I didn't know how, how far away it was or anything, but 
I know it was in the Pacific someplace uh, and uh, southwest someplace from San Francisco. But, uh, but the whole country geared up to it. Uh, they closed down all like uh, the automobile manufacturing and uh, those plants made tanks and guns and so forth. Uh, the railroad, uh, steam cars, steam engines, so forth that were made, they were also made, but those factories geared up to make, uh, to make uh, artillery guns, tanks, uh, they built new factories to make air airplanes and so forth, but the whole, whole country geared right up to, uh, uh, to uh, support the war effort. As I mentioned before, of course we covered it all uh, when the war ended. I, uh, we, we didn't have any big celebrations where we were. We were down in southern Germany. Maybe we turned to each other, shook our hands, shook our hands with each other, and said, "Thank God we made it." So I guess that's that's it. Oh, did you want this? Yeah, we have a copy of it here that you gave us before. Oh, like that one there. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> I was over there going to uh, where the Battle of Bulge was fought and some other place, Mamagan Bridge in 1994, and in the woods we could still find the uh, shrapnel. This is a piece, uh, I'm not sure whether it's from an artillery or a mortar shell, but you can see it's quite big. You wouldn't want to get hit by this. <laughs> yeah. you'd, you'd be when, it, when it comes out and it bursts, it's red hot. At night, it's it's a bright red, a bright red color when the, when those artillery shells burst. And they're, they're, they're hot, hot. And uh, I've got on, on that pro pat patrol that I mentioned. I've got uh, <laughs> this here. Well, there's the travels of a dollar bill that I, I carried with me, and I wrote so like the place of the Siegfried Line, the, the Ramadan Bridge, and stuff, stuff like that. The pictures of uh, the Ramadan Bridge, but this is uh, this is the original picture of uh, when we came back from that patrol two days later. Uh, our regimental commander awarded the 12 of us the, the combat infantry badge. Which one were you? Can you pick me out there? <laughs> uh, the guy in the middle there? Um, I'm guessing. There yep. you got me. <laughs> which one did which one pointed out with your hand? Yep. <laughs> you see at that time I had that uh, sniper rifle yet. Yeah, the O3 Springfield rifle. Mm -hmm. You can tell, see the scope on there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's the, that's the original picture. Well, if you guys got time or anything, if you want to, uh, I've got a lot of pictures here in the, in the area where we where we fought uh, during the Battle of Bulge, especially. I was I was over there in 1994. I have uh, friends over there. Uh, that I met when I was there in 1994, and they have a, a museum in, in, in Belgium. And uh, <coughs> I've, uh, I, I still write them. They've been here to, to my house visiting, and uh, we've been over there. In fact, they've been over there three times. And uh, I've, uh, I donated the uniform that I came home with uh, uh, to, their, uh, to their museum. So that's about it, I guess. <laughs>